So we're in the midst of a series, if you could call it a series. I'm just picking out a psalm here or there from the book of Psalms. There are 150 in all. I've called it Summer in the Psalms. We've done this on a couple of other occasions. Technically, it still is summer. Uh, It's still summer until the third week of this month. So we'll continue this for one more week after today, and then we'll get into something new. But we've looked at two Psalms already, Psalm 13 and Psalm 103. Psalm 13 is a psalm of lament. There are different kinds of psalms. Psalm 13 is a psalm of lament, where the psalmist is lamenting to God, complaining to God about a problem in his life or in his nation. Psalm 103 is a psalm of praise, a psalm that praises God. Now, Psalm 37, as Mo mentioned, is a wisdom psalm. And so something unique about a wisdom psalm is that it doesn't speak to God as psalms of lament and psalms of praise do. A wisdom wisdom psalm speaks to us. It shares wisdom with us. And this psalm begins by telling us, fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers. Have you ever felt like that? You think to yourself, well, I'm trying to do what is right. I'm trying to obey God's word, and it seems like I'm just struggling. Meanwhile, this other person, maybe they don't even believe there is a God. They're, maybe they're even actively opposed to the things of God, and they seem to be prospering. Doesn't seem fair. And so that's what the psalmist here is talking about, fretting about wrongdoers or evildoers who seem to be prospering while he's struggling. Now, the Hebrew word translated fret literally means to burn. So he's not talking about, and David is the psalmist once again, he's not talking about just a mild annoyance. He's talking about something that causes him to burn within. Do you ever burn with anger or resentment? Because evildoers seem to be prospering, but you're struggling. So this psalm deals with that problem. What should we do instead of fretting about evildoers prospering. Well, this morning I want to share with you, and this outline really isn't unique with me, at least the first two parts, what we should do when, when we feel like this is we should first look up, second, look ahead, and third, look around. Look up, look ahead, look around. So let's look at these three things one by one. The first, look up. First, We should look up and trust in the greatness and goodness of God. Now, Mo already read the first 13 verses, and we're really going to focus on the first 13 verses. But let's read verses 3 through 7 one more time. And take note of, of what David says that we should do instead of fretting. Verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way. Over the one, over the man who carries out evil devices. So, what are we told to do in these verses? We're told to, verse 3, trust in the Lord. Verse 4, delight yourself in the Lord. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. And verse 7, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Trust in the Lord, verse 3. To trust 
To trust someone uh, means that we need to believe certain things about that person. Now, I remember back when um, I first moved down here, first time uh, homeowner. Sometimes I had to uh, call some people for help. I remember calling George on a few occasions. I remember once early on, uh, my water pipes were, were frozen. I was getting no water. And so he and uh, Chuck Sawatsky came and, and uh, helped me with that. Uh, I believed that they could help me, that they, they, they knew what they were doing, unlike myself. And so I trusted them. And so if we are to trust in God, we must believe certain things about God. Do you believe that He is a great God? Do you believe that He is a, a good God, that He is able and willing to do what He says? If you believe that, then you can trust Him. Uh, we see His goodness in the cross, that God the Father sent the Son into this world to die for us, for our sins. He didn't have to do that, but He is a God of mercy and grace. And so we see His goodness in the cross. We see His power in creation. The cross shows us that sometimes He do, does His uh, mightiest works in unexpected ways. When God the Son came, He came as a humble, poor man. He died on a cross. Not the way people expected God to bring salvation. But we can trust God. Maybe He won't do things the way that we expect it. But we can trust in the Lord. Uh, we're told to commit our way to the Lord. That means to entrust Him with our lives. To hand our life over to Him. Have you ever, have you ever worried about something? How you were going to, to get something done? I can think of my... The occasion with uh, the pipes frozen, uh, how, how you were, were fretting over that. But you ask someone, would you be able to take care of this for me? And when that person says yes, how does that make you feel? This thing that you've been worrying about, fearing, fretting about. If they say yes and you believe that they're able to help you, to take care of that. And that gives you a sense of calmness, a sense of peace. And so that's what David is saying here to do, to commit our way to the Lord, to entrust God with our lives. Uh, the Apostle Peter was probably thinking of this verse, verse 5, when he urges his readers in 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxieties on God because He cares for you. To put that all on Him. The image is, is having a heavy burden on our backs and, and to, to take that off and to, to place it or give it to God. Commit your way to the Lord. It says, delight yourself, going back to verse 4, in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. What does that mean? Does that mean that if I trust in the Lord, if I commit my way to Him, delight myself in Him, that I'll, uh, I'll get that job I always wanted, that house I always wanted, that relationship I always wanted, that family I, I always wanted? Does it mean that? Well, maybe you'll get those things, but maybe you won't. It doesn't mean that we'll get everything we ever wanted. Going down to verse 16, it says, Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. So that implies that sometimes the righteous, those who are following God, will have little. So this verse is not saying that just trust in God and you'll have everything you'll ever want. You'll be rich, you'll be healthy, and all of that. That's really not what this verse is saying. What it's saying is that if we're truly delighting ourselves in the Lord, then first of all, we won't have selfish desires, that our desires will be His desires for us. And what we will truly want to do is to please God 
and glorify Him. And so if that's our mindset, delighting ourselves in the Lord, wanting what He wants, then we really won't be envious of what others have. We'll have God, we'll have His promises to us, and that is to be enough. With that, we are to be content. So the psalm is not saying just trust God and everything will be fine. As we know from the life of David, as we, even, we see in this psalm that when we follow God, there will often be hard times, difficulties, disappointments. However, what this psalm is telling us is that trusting God is the wise thing to do. And one of those reasons is we know it's the better path when we look ahead. So we look up, trusting in God, trusting in His goodness and His greatness, looking up, but next look ahead. And really that's what Psalm 37 begins with when it says, fret not. We're told all throughout this psalm, and we won't get to the end this morning, the 40 verses, but what the psalmist tells us is that we should look ahead and see the destinies of the wicked and the righteous. And really the wicked here doesn't refer to those who are really the most evil people in the world. It's really just talking about someone who has disregarded God, uh, has no concern about uh, living for God, no desire to please Him, no faith in Him. And so what we're told to do is to look ahead. Psalm 37 encourages us to take the long view, to not just look at the here and now, where, where some people who are not following God seem to be prospering while we're struggling, not just look at the present, but also look ahead at what is to come. Uh, look at verse 2. We have here the reason for why we should fret not. The first word of verse 2 is for, which really means because. Fret not yourself because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers for or because they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. And so what you see now is temporary. And so the psalm says, look ahead. Take the long view. There's a contrast here in Psalm 37 between the destinies of the wicked and the righteous. Those who are following God and those who are not. Uh, going down to verse 8. Let's just look at these verses once again. Verse 8 says, Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. So again, fretting here is more than just worrying. It's really an anger, a resentment about what is happening. Comparing myself to others. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. Verse 9. For the evildoers shall be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. The wicked plots against the righteous and gnashes his teeth at him. But the Lord laughs at the wicked, for he sees that his day is coming. So there's a contrast. And that contrast continues really throughout the remainder of the psalm. And five times, the psalm says that evil, evildoers will be cut off. What does that mean? The psalmist is talking about divine judgment. In the end, he says, there will be justice. Now, when we examine what the New Testament says, What we understand is that if there's not justice in this life, there will be justice at the final judgment. We will all have to stand before God one day. And so we're to look ahead. The Bible talks about a heaven and a hell. It talks about evildoers being cut off. 
As I said, evildoers, wicked, not talking about those who are the worst of the worst, but anyone who refuses to give his or her life to God through trusting in Jesus Christ. The contrast is in verse 11 that the meek shall inherit the land. Maybe that verse sounds familiar to you because Jesus said some similar words in his Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. He's probably thinking of Psalm 37 verse, verse 11 when he said, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So not, not just the land as in uh, Psalm 37, but the earth. So he's talking about a reversal of fortunes. Maybe the meek are suffering now, are struggling now, but that is not a permanent situation. Uh, the meek, we often think of the meek person as being a weak person. But the meek are those who, who choose the way of patient faith instead of self-assertion. People often say, nice guys finish last. Uh, but that's not what Jesus says. It's not what he says here. That's not what Psalm 37 says. In fact, Jesus is the ultimate example of meekness. God the Son in human flesh. All-powerful God. And yet he came in meekness, in gentleness, in humility. Willing to die on a cross. Willing to be mocked and ridiculed and suffer. He's the greatest example of meekness. And those who have that same attitude, that same uh, outlook on life, that right now is not all that there is, to have the long view, to look ahead at what is coming. But what the Bible promises for those who follow God and warns for those who do not. You might wonder about verse 13 where it says that the Lord laughs at the wicked. It's not because wickedness is funny. And it's not because he doesn't care about the wicked. The Bible says that God is, is not willing that any should perish. Many of the verses of Scripture um, speak of God really lamenting about how people will not turn to him and receive eternal life. And so it's not that God doesn't care or value the wicked. Really what this is saying or showing us is that God is doing the opposite of, of fretting. Laughing is the opposite of fretting. When you fret or fretting about something, do you feel like laughing? Probably not. It's the opposite. If you're laughing at a situation, you're not fretting about it. And so what this is really saying is that God does not fret about the wicked because, as it says in this verse, he sees that his day is coming. There is a day of judgment coming. God is a, a just God. We've been made in God's image. And so we also have a desire for justice. The Bible says we really have a problem, and that is our sinfulness. We are all sinners, guilty before God. And God can deal justly with our sin in only one of two ways. Either we will stand before him guilty and we will be punished for our own sin. Or we can take advantage of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Uh, when we turn from our sin, when we repent of our sin. and trust in what Jesus has done for us on the cross, then our sin has been dealt with. He has suffered, Jesus has suffered for our sin, paid, atoned for our sin. And so God is a just God. Our sin must be dealt with. It can only be dealt with or dealt with by 
the cross, that's the gospel, or we will have to deal with it ourselves. And so there is a day of judgment coming, but there's also a day of glory coming for those who have put their faith in Christ. And so we're to look up, we're to look ahead, and then thirdly, we are to look around. We should look around and find ways to do good. Uh, have you ever been content, happy, until you looked at what other people were doing? You're enjoying your vacation until you see on Facebook what another family is doing. Uh, they're, they're eating at a fancy restaurant while you're uh, having a ham sandwich at Subway. Uh, they're staying at a five-star hotel while you're staying at the Econo Lodge. Their kids seem so well-behaved in all of their pictures uh, while your kids are arguing in the minivan about who sits where. You know, I, I, I would be fine with Subway and the Econo Lodge, but then when you begin to compare with what other people have, then you become envious, discontent, unhappy sometimes if our mindset isn't right. And so, instead of looking around and fretting, even burning with anger and resentment, how about other people are, seem to be prospering, and they're not even following, some of those people are not even following God. Well, maybe I'm struggling, doesn't seem fair, doesn't seem right. Well, what the psalm also says here is to look around we shouldn't be looking around at others and fretting. We should be looking around for good things to do, for what the Lord wants us to do. Uh, did you notice what verse 3 says? It says, trust in the Lord and do good. So trusting in God doesn't mean inactivity. It doesn't mean just to remain passive. There are some things that we're to trust the Lord for that really we can't do anything about. You know, there are questions we have, mysteries in life. Uh, we don't have the answers to. And so we just have to trust the Lord that He's a good God and a wise God. Uh, we have to, have to trust Him for the future many times because we don't have control. We can prepare, but we don't have control over everything uh, that might happen in the future. And so trust in the Lord, but, but sometimes there are things that, that God does want us to do. He wants us to do uh, good things things that we can do, things that He's given us opportunity to do, uh, abilities, gifts, money to do, whatever the case might be. So not, don't just trust in the Lord and remain passive, but trust in the Lord and, and look around, not to fret, but to look around at what we can do that is good. And so look up, look ahead, and look around. You know, we can look around and we can fret. We can uh, even burn with anger and resentment about how we're doing and how it seems other people are doing, especially those people who, who have no desire to please God, maybe even actively opposed to the things of God. And so we can fret when we look around. But instead, we should look up, look up to God, trust in Him, commit our ways to Him, delight in Him, in who He is, what He's promised for us. Look ahead. Look ahead to what God has promised for us. If we're struggling now, that situation will not be permanent. And also look around and see what we can do now that would, that would please God, that would glorify Him. We can even do that in our struggles. Uh, sometimes simply remaining faithful to God in our struggles can be uh, a great testimony, the greatest testimony to the power of the gospel. So look up, look ahead, and look 
around.